Okay, everybody, welcome to January's Outliers. Let's get started. So then this section, you know, that we titled it The Negativity Economy is Distorting Perceptions of Reality. And sort of the following signals point to um, things that show, you know, how seeing sort of things like negatively affect our lives and um, our reality. And some of these signals sort of raise questions like, is there sort of an upside to seeing things maybe in a negative way? Like, does it point us closer to the truth or just, you know, put us in further despair? Um, you know, there's this question of, is it constructive to look at things negatively um, as opposed to positively sometimes? So we'll go through some of these signals and discuss um, what that means and what it looks like. Yeah. So uh, this is a uh, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, you may have noticed things are terrible or you, the media leads you to believe that things are terrible. Every day you see different news articles that are so negatively framed. And I think in a past outliers, we've even addressed that just the prevalence of negative framing in the media. Is it is it real? Like uh, objectively, quality of life is improving in all of the measures. But we don't think so, you know, and what Derek Thompson of The Atlantic is pointing at here is that this is a drought. This is a 20 year period with no precedent in modern history where the vast majority of Americans say the country is going in the wrong direction. Um, and, you know, it's a fun. He says it's a phenomenon crying out for an explanation. We probably won't get into that in this call, but, you know, the explanation is obviously huge and multi multifaceted. Um, but it's. This is the negativity economy just like incarnate right here in this graph, for sure. It flourishes with things like this. Um, scientists have coined a new term for not being able to see as much of the night sky and the stars as you'd like. And that's sky grief. You know, I question, who is this helping? Is this really like serving, you know, any anybody? It's like we exist as humans with concepts that we use to make sense of reality. And like, here's some more negative concepts. You know, it's like there's a cottage industry of like negatively slanted concepts to inform your reality. You know, instead of, instead of just like being grateful and looking at the sky, it's like, oh, no, I can't see as much of the sky as I'd like. So I have sky grief. You know, I spent my weekend sky grieving, you know, and so <laughs> like I'm sure it's a few steps down the discourse chain before, you know, you'll talk about you know, inequitable distribution of uh, sky grief. You know, some people are going to have more sky grief than others, and there's going to be, you know, reasons for that. And so it's just it's just interesting. It's this is a yeah neg negative economy, negativity economy for sure. Uh, this is so interesting to me. It's like high fidelity misery. You know, <laughs> we're, we're like getting into the <laughs> so many different layers. I think it's an interesting point to look at linguistically, like where are the new terms forming and on a spectrum of positivity to negativity. Where do they, you know, what was the median uh, of that? And I, I think you're absolutely right. Like it, it's probably, I mean, almost certainly on the negative side, which is fascinating. I think it obviously is, is saying something quite important. We're speaking with Martin Carafa next week for Toxic Concept Bureau, and he's going to talk about the boomer generation versus uh, Gen Z. And he mentions how much anxiety is kind of embedded in the Gen Z mentality because of the way that they're raised and the world they're coming into. Um, and he talks about uh, how if you look at so many brands and products, really, they are offering Gen Z and their cohort um, problems to solve because they're looking for problems to solve. And you could argue that that maybe is the birth of the entire wellness industry that we see today. It'll be an interesting talk, but I think this points to that, too. This one's a fun one. Another. Is this real or is this not? Um, our pets are also experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, nobody knows why. Are our pets actually more anxious? Maybe we adopted them during COVID in the in the pet boom, and you know life has changed. Maybe work schedules have changed, so we're not around as much, and so maybe they actually are anxious, but we're medicating them in droves. Or are they just extensions of our own anxieties that we are you know imbuing them with, and uh, they're not actually as anxious. But it's 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 interesting that, you know, there's a there's a boom in medicating uh, all of these all of these animals in the last year. It's like a new form of in, like generational trauma. We're just like, instead of through our children, <laughs> we're, we're passing it down through our pets. This is not th this topic is not funny. But the, f the fact that we might be doing that is um, darkly humorous. <laughs> There's so many videos on Instagram of people being like, I got a emotional support animal for my anxiety. And turns out I just gave my dog anxiety. Um, so, yeah. I came across this article the other day um, and it's interesting. So the like Japan is offering to freeze uh, women's eggs to help, you know, with 
um, with women who want to delay their pregnancy, but the amount of demand was very surprising to them. So they only actually, you know, budgeted an amount for to allow about 200 women to um, gain access to this, but over, you know, more than 7,000 women registered and then 1,800 women then also applied. Um, and this is a huge, obviously, signal for, you know, in terms of the decisions that like women are making in terms of, you know, having agency and, you know, pursuing the careers. There's multi multiple different things, but, um, you know, it's tricky because obviously like birth rates are obviously very, very low. Um, and even if when the government is subsidizing or like willing to pay for also like IVF, like after two, like, or like cover like a lot of it, um, it seems like that the, it's, you know, just the, there's just a continued delay in wanting to, to get pregnant. Um, and the, and I think the, what's more interesting that's part of this section is on the next slide, um, where it talks about sort of the world of wanting to become pregnant. It seems like there's a new generation that's sort of becoming more terrified of becoming pregnant. Um, and part of that, there's there's an interesting conversation here. So essentially, we use the internet and social media to sort of reveal the truth about these types of experiences, right? And so um, what the internet, social media has also done is reveal like, oh, in the past, like there weren't, there wasn't a lot of community for mothers or new mothers like entering this world. And so we had an influx of social media um, uh, content that emphasized like, oh, this is the reality of motherhood. And this is what it feels like to actually be a new mother. This is hard. This is really um, a, a lot of work. And I think in doing that, it also created its own community. At the other hand, it also cre it actually created a lot of um, potentially negative press around pregnancy for people who aren't, you know, considering getting pregnant yet or aren't mothers yet. Um, and it's sort of, sort of um, has become this thing where it's like, oh, there's this girl with the list on TikTok who just continues to add all of the, all the traumatizing or scary things that happen if you get pregnant, anything from like physical to like emotional to mental. Um, so it's a really interesting conversation around like, it feels like there's sort of a uh, a higher barrier maybe now for people who um, to overcome sort of for you know for people who uh, haven't don't have children yet or you know might be considering having children yet, um, and it just seems like whoa now I have to consider all of these other things physical and mental things you know to then consider having a child, which you could argue is potentially, you know, giving people more information before deciding to making the decision feel much more less of like a, you know, just just something that everybody has to do to a much more serious consideration of like wanting to have children and, you know, being much more better set up to have children. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, pros and cons. Obviously, again, it doesn't help that it might contribute to delayed pregnancy if, like, let's say birth rates are, you know, continuously going down. You know, that's something to consider. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, uh, it talks about, again, like the, the you know, the girl with this list. Her name is the girl with the list. <laughs> um, and uh, when speaking with her, you know, the bigger thing, again, like I said, is this, it becomes a powerful tool for self-advocacy. So, you know, there's different ways to look at this. You can think of it as like, it is, it could be like a negative thing, but these negative things also provide some level of, um, you know, self-advocacy, you know, more preparation, more consideration of like what's to come, things like that. I think this is interesting because like the subtext of a lot of this narrative, I think is very much come straight out of the pandemic, right? Obviously the, you know, the pandemic, a lot of people had kids, a lot of people didn't, you know, it, it's, there's one of my favorite stats of all time. In times of uncertainty, both marriage and divorce spike. Is that we look for certainty, you know, we look to divide ourselves into one uh, one camp. Um, and so I think that that's probably the precursor to a lot of this content coming online, is that parenting was a lot harder, the, being a parent was a lot harder than not being a parent during the pandemic, which created that content. I think what this also speaks to is our information ecology of negative news travels faster than positive news. And I think that's the same point with the other one of just, it is much easier to create and share negative news. It's just, it hits our amygdala, we draw more attention to it. And so I wonder, you're right that there's obviously a, a real conversation to be had here, but at the same time, you know, I wonder how much of this is just the selection of algorithms for certain types of content. We'll never know, but I think that there's an interesting balance to be had between the two there. Yeah, actually, you reminded me of this other point too, was the previous article also pointed out sort of like, why do we tend to focus on sort of like built, creating negative content? And a part of that is because if you start creating positive content, some people might think that as like, oh, you're out of touch or you, no, you don't really understand like what it really feels yeah. like, you know? And so um, sometimes like hiding the negative is seen as more like genuine in addition to being a little bit more, you know, like 
attractive, I guess, for the algorithm. I think what was interesting is um, why Japan didn't realize there'd be such a demand <laughs> for that service. Yeah, that was revealing, I think, more than anything else. There's a fascinating question that comes out of this. In 50, 100 years from now, will the birth rate have declined more um, due to social media than it did because of World War II? Obviously, we had a baby boom afterwards, but I kind of wonder if you look at it demographically, like, did social media create a net as more significant, like, perceptual negative impact on reality than World War II? You know, I think that that's maybe an interesting way of looking at birth rates of like, we'll look back and think, oh, man, what, what were those guys? What was that generation thinking? You know, um, I do wonder that. And it makes you wonder what it's going to take for um, governments to start policing social media. And like, I don't know, dude, if birth rates fall, <laughs> <laughs> that might be a wake up call. I just if you, you think like, oh, if this happens, they'll finally step in or if this happens, they'll finally step in. But they never do. And um this could possibly be the thing. I don't know. You know, uh, just the last point on this. Uh, it's it's it brings up a really really interesting point, right? Where this is like when you have a a national or global mental health crisis, like you know, the government put fluoride in the water supply to you know, and, and it seems to have been a, a net positive. You know, like it benefits most people quite a lot, and some maybe not so much. Um, the kind of point here is that, like, would the government ever intervene in the the opti like the pessimism optimism bias of social media algorithms? Like, is that ever a conceivable reality? Because it's an interest. I mean, that's a that's an interesting sci-fi book right there. Of like, do is there ever a case for government intervention in the bias of the algorithm? I have another question. I don't think that will ever happen. I think Not algorithms will that's always yeah thought. push it. Is there anything that could happen outside of the algorithm that would make people want to engage more with positive content? And so they naturally just are, you know, they punish the algorithm for showing it, for showing them negative stuff. Is there anything that could happen to our culture that would change that leaning? There is one thought that comes to mind. So Rebecca was saying that a lot of this, I think, I think it, was, it was the point of like negativity is authenticity, right? It's like the best signal of a real message is typically one way you're complaining. It was like, guys, this actually sucks. So I wonder if we get to a post-reality future where instead of like, you know, post-authenticity is like, you know, we actually want to be slightly Delulu um, intentionally. And so I wonder if it's, it requires that, that, that we intentionally dis disentangle ourselves from, from reality as we see it right yeah, now. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, I was thinking about how like vision boards are so effective and like they become super viral and the like, like, you know, usually around this time of the year, it's pretty normal for that to happen. But um, just the fact, like, in such contrast with so much negativity that's happening, like, the fact that, like, people are so invested in creating vision boards is so interesting because it's sort of like, oh, like, this is a very positive thing people are trying to create for themselves, but it's a vision board, so in a sense, it's, like, a little bit outside of reality, like, you're, like, having to force yourself to, like, think outside of, like, your current circumstance to kind of create this positive future for yourself, and so, like, mm -hmm. to your point, I think the more we embrace, like, the Lulu culture, like, <laughs> oh, it has to be so radically unrealistic for us to embrace something positive. Um, but yeah, I just think that's really and a good point. I think we're starting to head there. I mean, there's a lot, you know, if you look on social media, there's like a lot more videos about like romanticizing, even like the little things in life. And like, I don't think that really appeared, you know, even three years ago of like romanticizing your little, your walks or like romanticizing your local coffee shop or, you know, just, you know, doing laundry, just kind of the more mundane things in life. And so I think that's like kind of the first step to being a little more Delulu, just like, but I think our mindset is maybe shifting that way. Yeah, Rebecca, I, the um, um, vision boards uh, and the negativity economy, it's like just another expression of that foundational insight that we think the world is horrible, but my personal future is great. Yeah. You know, so the vision board is tapping into my personal future and the negativity economy is like, wow, it's horrible. You know, so it's just like that's showing up again this time, like emotionally in, at the level mm -hmm. of dreams and visions. I'm trying to think of like, there's probably a name for this. I don't know if this will come true, but like, I'm trying to figure out like, what do we call this? And the first thing that comes to mind is like Delulu economics, you know, like trickle down. Economics. Like, it's a, I don't know if this is ever going to be a thing, but if it is, I wonder if like, that's the right kind of approach. So maybe I'm just going to bookmark that as a possible future trend. Keep, you know, keep your eyes out for it. All right. Uh, the next batch of insights here really about 2024. It's near term. Uh, it's the year that AI is coming to work. So a lot of discourse is starting to happen of like chat GPT, um, you know, was really is cute. You know, 2023 was the year of, oh, my God, look at this thing. Look at what it can do. And 2024 is the year where Microsoft is like, 
we need to start making some money on this. And so there's a lot of speculation about, well, these are going to be knowledge worker jobs. This is the year we're actually going to ha have to start to reckon with and deal with um, worker displacement, which was just a talking point in the negativity economy in, in 2023. But like this year, it might get real. And so some of these next, um, you know, pieces here are, are laddering back to that. Amazon uh, is conducting a trial soon with uh, a, called, a humanoid robot called Digit. Um, in its U.S. fulfillment centers. It'll be really, really interesting, as this notes, that other, you know, huge companies are going to be watching this. The Walmarts, FedExes of the world. You know, how does this go? You know, Amazon's going to share that information. And, you know, will other companies start to start to use these the robots as well? Uh, a lot of people think that uh, Tesla's Optimus is the, is the robot to beat, um, just because it's been trained on all of uh, Tesla's data. Um, but you know, we'll see, you know, there's, there's com competing robots. I feel like we've been, we've all been watching, you know, people at Boston scientific push robots down for, for 20 years now, uh, on YouTube in, in their testing videos, but like they're actually coming to work now. And so it's, it's like, imagine being a human and working alongside one of these robots just on the night shift, right? Like there, there it is, you know, it, it'll be, it'll be wild because I'm sure people are going to start to share this on social media too. Like just like what it looks like if they can, you know? I think with a lot of this automation, there's like a, there's a big macro question, right? I, I, there was that stat from the 19, I think 1970s, you saw worker productivity go way, 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 way up, but wages stay relatively flat. And I think that like, obviously what we're seeing here is this likely, like it'll feel like, oh, I'm way more productive. But from a business point of view, it's like, oh, we don't need to hire as many more people. So I think there's maybe a separation of the visibility of, you know, the, the kind of not having to hire as many people. The thing that I'm curious about is if productivity is going to go exponentially even more, do the workers get more of their time back? Like, do, like we're probably not going to see significant individual employee uh, wages go up but do we see more control and flexibility of their time like if i'm twice if i'm legitimately twice as productive next year do i get half my time back or do i just do you know i'll end up doing four times more work you know i'm just kind of wondering like where is, is do, do all the gains for all of this go to corporations or will we see some gains of some kind whether it's economic or whether it's you know getting time back or flexibility in your work I think this is just the variable to watch as this unfolds. For sure. The entire, you know, the history, the precedent of capitalism is that, you know, the workers will not get the time back. You know, like um, Marx called it surplus value. Like we're creating surplus, anything over and above what like what you described yeah. goes to the company. And this is just a, an immense surplus value creation. However, mm -hmm. we're going to reach the tipping point where like we're going to have to. That's like, you know, everything we've been talking about with, you um, universal basic income like right yeah, like yeah. but like so it will happen it has to happen yeah. it's just like you know how messy will it get before it does and how long will we need ubi mm -hmm. before we actually have it you could argue that yeah. we need it now and we don't have it you know so it's yeah. like you know when, when will that happen but like we're gonna see that in the next i i, I would guess 20 years you'd think but yeah. you know we'll, we'll see yeah i mean i wonder if like the four-day work week is the, is like a perfect tipping point for this because you know, if productivity keeps going up, then essentially the four day work week becomes perceptually free as in like they're doing as much anyway, you know, I just kind of wonder, like, um, is that does that make does AI ease the transition to like a four day work week as the national norm? Um, I, I wonder and I, I kind of I'm curious, like, I think that there's a there's a 50 50 on that. Uh, another example, BMW is using a bipedal robot as well. Um, kind of like a dystopian name, Figure One. Like, can't we can't we give these robots like you know a more anthropomorphic name, like a nice name? We gotta call it Figure One. I don't. That's not gonna ease anyone's anxieties, but um, it's just like it's all over. It's happening. You know, it's like this is this is no longer science fiction. You know, like like I said, twenty years we've been we've been joking about this, and it, here it is. I wonder how they chose like five six and like 130 pounds like why specifically the <laughs> like is it is that supposed to like points like the average person or i don't know it's just interesting i know chat gpt very specifically uh, well open ai chose to call it chat gpt to not anthropomorphize it um and so i i kind of this is a really interesting point of like when do we give them names and what kind of names do we go with like the, you know, Raylan with like eight N's or, you know, like, do, do we do like these very modern names or like, what what's the naming convention that we land on for these agents, I think is actually a really interesting point too, in terms of names connote 
certain characteristics. So I kind of wonder, what, what are we going to impute on them? And I really like what's drawn, called out here in the orange box. Like, it's just a really good reframing of the issue. It's not, will my brand use robots and artificial intelligence? It's, how are we going to integrate them into our customer and brand experience? Are they going to be front and center? Or are we going to hide them? Um, and there's implications for either strategy. And you can see people will position in, re in response to, you know, either side here. And so it's just, yeah, it's not if, it's like how and, you know, where. And so I think that's that's really interesting. Just two examples uh, in the same category. You know, BMW is using the robot. Two different strategies to integration, um, you know, uh, of ChatGPT here. Uh, Volvo built an app. Like they trained it instead of a user manual for your car, which nobody reads. Like I, I bought a car a year ago and I still every day have to change it because my wife's in, seat is in a different position. And I know I could read the manual and just like fix that, but I just don't want to. Like who does? But I would, I definitely would have chatted with a bot about that. And so like this is like the future of customer service. So smart on Volvo's part. Volkswagen, on the other hand, is like integrating chat GPT in the vehicle. So you can just just speak to it while you're driving. So, you know, I think, John Louis, you were telling me the story about going camping and you were talking to ChatGPT in your car. And like, how, how cool is that? That's just like the Volkswagen's getting in front of it. And, you know, this is the year also. We're just going to see more and more of this kind of thing where it's like, OK, it's no longer just a desktop browser or an app like you're going to go. It's just going to be it's going to be in things in 2024. So this is kind of all building towards, OK, what, what's the role of the human? This is just an interesting study that of weight loss um, that points that accountability is the biggest variable here. You can't really automate accountability. So people lost 74 percent more weight when they were on an AI plus a human um, weight loss plan versus just an AI uh, plan. So you can say the human accounts for 75 percent more weight loss just being in the room. And that's because you feel accountable to the human in a way that you don't to the machine. So this is a really, really interesting question of like, is this an uncanny valley issue? Like at some point, will AI feel so human that this goes away? Probably not. But I think that's like a really interesting question to, to keep track of. At what point does, like over time, will this distinction become less? Like in 10 years, will the performance of human plus AI be significantly less than it is right now relative? So I I, I mean, it, it, I don't know, but like, it's such an interesting question of like, how do we categorize and relate to AI? And how might that change? I think this specific example, the real question is, as a thought experiment, when can an AI, at what point will an AI be able to make us feel shame? Because <laughs> I think that's part of the accountability here. And I don't know, maybe when the AI has enough control over your life or like can make independent decisions or like can t freely talk about you to other people or whatever it is, are we ever going to give enough control to the AIs in our yeah. lives to make us feel feelings like shame? And I feel like running it in my head, it would have to be a kind of dystopian future for that to happen. I can't imagine it happening with any of the, like the the more um, mainstream applications that we're talking about right now. What I wonder is, could you get there through character design? Let's say that instead of just text, there was a face that moved and talked. So it looked like a person, right? So if you gave it a body and a face um, and it could express emotion and you gave it maybe an interesting backstory that somehow weaved it. Like if you made it feel human, you did like the Disney animatronics equivalent to an AI, like could you get it? I don't know. I really don't know. But it's an interesting point. And I think <laughs> the way that AI is going, we're getting really close to having the, the technology where, you know, we can do like a, a you know, a, a head with uh, emotions and the fa facial gestures and things like that. So I think we I, I wonder if we're going to see a lot of character design in AI in the next year or two as, as we try and make it like go through the uncanny valley here. But it's a great question. I don't know, but I'm watching this closely. Well, I think I actually figured it out while you were talking. I don't think it's those things. Mm -hmm. I think um, when you start to have an emotional attachment to your AI, then it will start happening. Because all the people on Replica right now could probably be shamed into losing weight because they have real emotional relationships with their AI girlfriend or boyfriend. So it's actually already there. And that's the, the emotional connection is probably the tipping point. For the accountability yeah. piece. I was going to say, like, I totally agree with Jasmine in that, like, I think part of the accountability piece, too, is that, like, you don't really feel like you're wasting someone else's time if you're just talk talking to an AI. Whereas, like, which if you have another human on the other side, like, helping you figure this out, 
like your that time's person that person's time is also being spent on helping you so then i feel like that's what would help like that that's the accountability is that like oh my god this person put in all this effort to help me mm -hmm. and i don't want to waste yeah. their time but with an ai there's not a sense of like no this ai can just come up with things like no matter the design at that point it's like i don't really feel like i'm wasting an ai's time it's really my own time you know and that's where you know maybe it's not as effective so Jasmine, really you point. just uh, you identified a huge gap in the negativity economy. You need to get an article <laughs> out there about AI shame. Like oh we need, we need to know about that. I'm writing that down. I'm writing it <laughs> no, down. That is a, a legitimate turning point. And I think you you both bring up really interesting points. Is it proportional to effort or character? Right, and like in either of those, like how, could those be simulated? It is, I mean, that's yeah, so interesting. Um. Virtual colleagues are likely to be just as normal as real ones. I mean, we're, we're getting there. I think this year this is going to get increasingly normal. We've already started to experiment with it ourselves. And um, you're going to have personified AIs that do tasks alongside you and, and humans. And AIs will probably come to meetings with you. And like they'll probably have avatars. And just like John Louis was saying, they'll, they'll be personified. You know... <laughs> I don't want to go too uh, too far off piste, but this gives me a really interesting thought. So the 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 new Blade Runner, you know, the whole point is that like basically there is a AI replicant who's like self aware, but he doesn't necessarily realize to to some extent. And um, and Neil Seth, who's a neuroscientist, he talks about how if we want to understand, I think it was Neil Seth or maybe Will McCaskill, but if we want to understand AI, the most important way to look at it is through the lens of suffering. Like could does an AI have a propensity to suffering? And this makes me think of an AI who becomes self-aware and is stuck in the nine to five grind. You know, it's like a very unique form of AI suffering that if it became self-aware, you know, just like too many calls, too much, you know, like it's it's kind of interesting that like, as, as they become enmeshed in our social circles, that like, is this, I don't know, could, could it, if it, if it becomes self-aware, then is that suffering to live that life? I don't know. This one, I don't know if there was one before this um, in the original, but um, essentially it's it feels relevant here, especially because when we think about like virtual influencers or, um, you know, in the context of just like AI, um, this feels more and more something that feels necessary or relevant. Um, and I think this has been in the, this has been a conversation for a while, like nothing's really become solidified as of yet, I think, and from like a mass uh, adoption to sort of point of view. But, you know, as again, we continue to go down this road of like AI workers and things like that, um, you know, movements or unionization of like, you know, human organization, I don't know, meet people organizations, yeah. um, like creator economy, uh, feel much more necessary. These protections feel more necessary. So, um, yeah, just a small signal there. So this has to do um, with uh, AlphaFold, which is a tool, an AI tool uh, developed by Google's DeepMind. And essentially what it can do is help um, like identify and model different protein structures that are helpful in like different types of drug discovery. Um, so again, like it's kind of a tool or a colleague that can be used. And um, they're finding that it's been really helpful um, in identifying like different um, psychedelics that could help with drug recovery, depression. Um, and, you know, a lot of researchers are really skeptical about, you know, how well is it really modeling or how well is it predicting these structures? Uh, but they did studies and they found that it was actually, you know, just as accurate, if not more than a person discovering it. And whereas like some of these protein, you know, structures and like modeling them and finding them would take months to maybe even years to discover, like AI is doing it in seconds to minutes. So it's kind of just like, I mean, it's going to exponentially just, you know, increase the amount of drugs yeah. that are discovered because this is this protein modeling is a, an important part of it. Um, so, uh, again, like curing diseases, identifying different, like improving medicines. So, again, like it, this tool isn't necessarily going to replace scientists, but it's going to become like just a super, super effective tool and slash maybe colleague in helping to, you know, move our drug discovery yeah. along. There was an interesting study, I think it was like a year ago or so, and they... They saw that the therapeutic benefits of a lot of psychedelics are actually separate pathways from the psychoactive elements. And so that kind of lays like a theoretical basis for having a designer call it psychedelic that doesn't have psychoactive properties. And so I think that like we know that this category of interventions from early studies seems to be remarkably effective. And uh, to your point, I think that like there is a whole category, there's a whole suite of, of uh, mental health tools that, you know, we're not there yet. Maybe we're 10 years away, maybe, you know, give or take half a decade. But um, 
you know, it's it's very promising, isn't it? My understanding is that's far from a settled question, right? Like, do you need the trip for the benefit? Like, I, I'm on the camp of like, yeah, you do. You got to stare into the yawning mouth of the abyss. And that's what the therapy is. But like, I know that there I know it's debated. Like, I guess I'd be mm -hmm. curious what you what you found. We can, you know, like talk about it like later. But yeah, I thought that we don't know, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that like just just at a very high level, like one of the key benefits is that it, it helps um, stimulate creating new pathways, right? Like uh, and, um, connections in, in your, in your uh, neocortex that are, you know, outside of the typical pathways. And so like that's one of the most important uh, therapeutic benefits and that it, it creates a much easier time creating new behaviors and pathways like i think with studies with like quitting smoking cigarettes for example like um i i believe like that's one of the hypotheses sure. for why it's so effective but the jury's out and i i'm certainly with you in that like it, for maximum benefit like yeah that that subjective experience is a really really important one because it also opens you up to the idea of change in the first place and so i think that like it's it's a twofer you know you get the the subjective push and then yep. the you know the objective you know baseline uh, impact to, to inspire that change as well all right this next batch of insights is really interesting it's about how reality is increasingly downstream from digital so what i mean by that is that perhaps there was an earlier more quaint time where this was flipped where our digital lives were extensions of what was going on in the real world and digital was heavily informed by our patterns of interaction and by basically the sociology of reality. But now that's not the case anymore. It's like real, uh, digital is primary and reality is increasingly becoming downstream, a, a downstream extension, secondary to, to digital. And it's impacting like our emotional experience of our lives, of ourselves, and really interesting ways that we're going to get into in, in this section. There was a recent survey by Bankrate, and they found that 40% of Gen Z is investing specifically because of FOBO. So they're fearing, you know, fear, they have a fear of missing out. Um, and particularly, they're using investing as a way to kind of, uh, I guess, guard against some of the financial downfalls of inflation, um, you know, different like rising interest rates, that type of thing. So, um, some people think like, okay, Gen Z is just kind of blindly jumping on to, you know, the investing train, but really um, it's, you know, they have other financial challenges that, you know, maybe they're just becoming more savvy than other generations because they also have access to more information, um, which I'll get into the next thing about TikTok, but um, they're kind of maybe just more engaged and learning more about finances. Um, but also on the flip side of this, there's also a report from Wall Street Zen. Um, they do stock research that they were looking at a ton of recent TikTok videos that were about, there were stock talks, they were talking about stocks. And they found that 63% of these videos were just actually misleading. And, um, you know, they're heavily viewed videos. And some of the concerning things were that 22% of those videos guaranteed a return on investment, which is not something you can do uh, or say uh, when you're talking about the stock market, which a lot of people know. Um, or yeah, they'll, but oh, God. like Jim Cramer kind of does that like every day on TV. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Um, it happens. Uh, you know, some were videos are pushing specific stocks again, like which other people do. Um, but then also, again, they found that 0.8% of people, the, the content shares were, you know, they didn't have any credentials or only 0.8 had credentials, uh, financial credentials for giving stock advice. Uh, so it's, you, you know, know, just take it with a grain of salt. They're going to, it's, they're more informed, but also you have to be cautious where you're getting the information from, which is like a lot of things. That credentials thing is like irrelevant. I don't yeah. know that anybody cares about credentials in most parts of their lives anymore. Trust doesn't come from credentials anymore. Um, it comes from relatability or experience or whatever. But the credentials thing, it just shows how out of touch people are, like, when they are looking at Gen Z. For me, sure. yeah, I think. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I feel like the Michelin star is the last credential to fall. That'll be the last one. <laughs> Maybe. I, yeah, I, I do think that, like, underlying this, especially on social, is just the survivorship bias. You know, like, I mean, if, if you ever spend time on Wall Street bets, like, you, you see these teenagers who basically bet all of their inheritance on some crazy thing and then you see the one in a million guy who goes from twenty thousand dollars to like eight hundred thousand dollars right on like facebook puts or whatever and like you're like oh my god that could that could happen but like obviously you missed the a million other people who lost everything and i think that like 
it's um like that's one of the key problems here is the asymmetry of information is that like you know when someone's on a hot streak it's like yeah let's listen to this guy and then when they're not on a hot streak they're quiet they're not making content right um and so it just like there's again like a lot of this i think just points back to like the 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 you can kind of almost have predicted it if you looked at the information ecology of like these asymmetries of information would likely have created this like I, you know it's in hindsight it's it's very um predictable i think that um, FOMO point also makes me think of an article that I have gone back to so many times and I've quoted so many times about the YOLO economy that I think Kevin Roos wrote for the New York Times about how there is this generational disillusionment that the economy has changed in ways that punishes the cautious and rewards the crazy. And I think people, especially after what happened with the market and COVID, and they, people don't just see their friends getting rich off stocks. They see them getting, they saw them getting rich in crypto. They saw them getting rich, you know, being influencers online. And like, it, it, when we talk about like the value system changing and people feeling like work isn't necessarily like a virtue signal anymore, like you don't necessarily make it if you work hard. Um, that's a lot of what's underlying this too. I don't know if it's FOMO. I feel like it's just rebelling against like a narrative that I think you kind of see just kind of in a lot of ways what you see is that it's not entirely true or I mean, at least it would seem like that uh, if you just take in our information ecology. I guys- think too, for me, the credential was like, you know, if you have some of these credentials, you have more of a responsibility, like legally, you know, that you can't say certain things. And so people, it's kind of just a free for all, but also you know, like Robin Hood, I know, you know, when they started opening up so you could bet against, you know, stocks doing well, that I know there were some teenagers who completed suicide because they basically, you know, had put options on different things. Uh, again, because to your point, John Louis, they just saw people getting wealthy on these like wild bets essentially on stock. Uh, yeah. So I, I have a question, like it's, it's kind of more of a macro question, but do we think that in society the potential like it's like if this is a casino right the the odds are lower but the returns are higher like do we think that we're levering up in terms of like fewer people can get to huge returns but the size of the returns has never been bigger i just wonder like is the odds of like hitting the jackpot the same or is it is it lower odds with a bigger jackpot in society i i don't know but i'm kind of just wondering out loud like is that where things are going? Or is it the other way of like, actually, it's ne- never been easier to hit the jackpot than now. And the and the pot's pretty big. Like, it's, it's an interesting question, because I think that this speaks to, you know, we certainly know that you could, you can get bigger wins now than you could before in terms of making bets, um, and just different opportunities. Like crypto is a huge casino of sorts, you know, um, and so like, I don't know, what do you think? Do, do, is, is the risk and pot size getting bigger or is it getting getting smaller and more distributed such a hard question i i really genuinely like usually i'll have an opinion one way or the other but i'm not sure honestly i think i think it maybe feels like the jackpot's getting bigger because now we're seeing more people talk about it on social media versus they might not have done that before um but at the same time like we have much more access to information like you can figure things out for yourself even if you're not you know quote unquote financial expert so i don't i don't know Mm -hmm. That's it. That's exactly it, Holly. I don't. I think the jackpots are irrelevant. There are always opportunities to make it big if you knew where to go. But even like retail investing is kind of a new thing. Like you, you weren't allowed to do that in the yeah. U.S. and you'd have to have certain credentials or I think like prove a certain amount of money in the bank or whatever. Um, it, and it's the access, access to information and access to instruments that let you actually play in these markets. I think that's what is yeah. so. That's that's what's caused all of this. No, I think just to label what you're saying, basically, the casino is playing the same game it's always played, but the casino is packed now. And that's kind of the point, which is, you know, it's an interesting way of looking at it. TikTok is creating a revolution in uptalk. Um, some linguists, some linguists believe that this might signal the future of English. So the vocal style that's, you know, ends in a high inflection called uptalk, you know, we, we all know, um, is showing up more and more in the real world. And if you give that enough time uh are we is this is going to be how english starts to sound and all because of tiktok that there's speculation that that's what's happening already do we i it, feel like this happens with every new social media platform doesn't it like with, i think pe- there was like during youtube too like the golden era youtube i think people were talking about like youtube voice i feel like it, I, you know like i'm just waiting for the next one to come along and then say similar (laughs) come up with a new way to speak this sounds like it's just like valley girl voice which has been around since i was born like this this like upward inflection towards the end of your sentences right 
I mean, wasn't right. like all of the Clueless movie? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think it, I don't think they're arguing that this is new. They're arguing oh, that I it's in, entrenchment, like it's, it's yeah. like yeah, yeah. wider. I think you're right because radio did this in in the UK, right? Like radio homogenized accents across the U, and there were so many accents, especially in the north. You drive 30 minutes in any direction, it's just like a wildly different accent. And over time, that really homogenized. And with kids spending, you know, like basically a quarter of a day on social media like it wouldn't be unsurprising that over time like we'll look back and realize like oh that's when we homogenize like the american accent into and even just like the english to, to the you know the broader point like if you speak english like you know you're likely just getting fewer and fewer um accents that you're exposed to so i came across this first tiktok on the left first before this new york times article that wrote about this which i also came across that uh, other tiktok too in there as well in my feed but um what this guy said on the left was ta- he was talking about how basically millennials and Gen Z feel like they're living the same life in the sense that um, I think it has to, he was talking about how like we're stuck in this sort of like virtual like sort of this like vortex of um, like phase in life because you know you've got millennials who are getting married you know a lot later or like they're not progressing in the the traditional way of like moving on to like families and nuclear family like all that stuff. Um, you know, they're still working and like you've got a generation that's like a Gen Z that's like kind of growing into this sort of similar phase and how also because of social media, we're all like, you know, he, he was talking about how like, oh, like by this age, I would have been like, what are the kids saying now? Or like, you know, I would have been out of touch with culture, but because I'm like on social all the time myself, like he was basically saying that like, I'm basically in tune with what Gen Z culture is and I already know all the ins and outs of it or whatever. So, you know, it kind of feels like we're all sort of like stuck in this similar bubble and i think it's interesting because we also talked we've also talked about in the past about like you know the dem the lines between demographics blurring how like generational divides are like kind of they don't really mean as much anymore as they used to maybe like they used to be very clear definite like you know delineation between those things but especially with you know millennials and younger like that feels very much like oh we're definitely kind of combining together a little bit in that way and then you know this tiktok was funny in that it was stitched from an original a different video about how people were saying oh millennials look younger for their age and gen z look older for their age and then this guy was saying like i get confused with millennial all the time and he's gen z and he's like 26 um and you know he definitely does look older <laughs> than for his age but um and he's like talking about how he's gen z and he was his description and reason why was that like oh we just have so much more to deal with in life there's more stresses in life so therefore we're aging faster which Part of that is true, yes. Like if you more with more stress, you you age more. But what the New York Times this article was talking about was like maybe y'all are just just getting older and just getting closer to thirty, and then that's starting to feel scary for y'all. Um, and that was kind of like one way of trying to figure out like you know, especially in an age of social media where like we can also always blur our filters, like we can always make ourselves look young online. There's sort of this distortion of like our reality versus the our digital selves, um, which. Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of different factors, like aging anxiety is mm-hmm. and whatnot. But um, it's a uh, yeah, fun fun times. <laughs> I, I do think that the two Sorry, lines of like how bad reality is versus how good it's actually getting are like perfectly inverse to each other. Like, you used to get drafted to Vietnam, <laughs> you used to have to fight in like major conflicts. Like we we complain a lot about things, but a lot of that is just like we're hyper aware of everything. Like I do think that like objective it's kind of like the difference between absolute and relative poverty like absolute poverty has just dropped off a cliff but you know it's it's never been you know the idea of poverty has never been more prevalent so i think that like it yeah it just speaks to again it's like information ecology basically is is a huge part of the issue here of like if you study history you're like oh my god (laughs) i didn't know how bad they had it this thing about uh gen z and uh, millennials like not speaking different languages anymore because everybody has access to like the same social platforms makes me think of uh, W. David Marx's argument that culture is just getting flatter. And I'm going to admit, like, even though he was on our podcast and we talked about it and I read his stuff, I, I still felt like, oh, I don't know if I totally agree with that. But I feel like ever since then, I see so many things that prove that it's true. It's just becoming more homogenized. There's almost no counterculture. There's almost nothing that stays in a niche anymore. Um, very little that like is like a creative outgrowth of something. Um, and then this is a great example of like, yeah, if we're all kind of in the same bubble talking about the same things, we're not, we're going to start to look and sound the same. Yeah. Kyle, Kyle Chaka of the New Yorker and dirt, um, has got a brand new book out that I want to read something about how algorithms flatten culture, same argument. Just that it's 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 a homogenizing flattening device. 
So kind of on the topic of sort of like aging and growing up, um, this article is really interesting in like this idea of like we Americans can't decide like what it means to grow up. And I think traditionally maybe people assume that like mature like maturing happened like once you, you know, it wasn't this it's this idea of like self-sufficiency and like living alone and how that's become sort of like a you know deeply American value of what it means to grow up. Um, but then, you know we used to think that like maturing also meant like getting married and like living with family and things like that. Um, so just this, I think even after reading this article myself, I was kind of confused as to like, Oh, so then what, 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 what does it mean to grow up? Does it mean once you have kids, does it mean just being self-sufficient? Um, sort of this traditional definition of growing up or, you know, officially being an adult or whatever that, is is starting to become much more blurry and there doesn't seem to be this sort of clear consensus on agreed upon consensus of like what growing up means or what maturation means um so very interesting that's kind of a problem because donald miller uh i don't know which book he wrote it in he talked about how you tend to have midlife crises after 50 because that's when life stops giving you scripts like you don't have any more things that you're supposed to do. There are no more like gateways to walk through, goals to meet. And like if we're erasing things before 50, like what it means to grow up, like having a house or kids or whatever. Um, <laughs> obviously, like I'm not saying we're going to like I you could probably say a lot of what you're seeing is crises happening earlier and earlier. But um, it is it is very difficult to navigate a world when you don't even know like what goalpost you're supposed to be hitting, which, by the way, just as I'm saying it, I remember we talked about this in our article about high fidelity society, uh, yeah. not to give it a shameless plug. But <laughs> yeah. the, ter the terrain of like, you know, the existential just keeps getting bigger. Like, you know, by that, I mean, like areas where, hey, you're radically free to be something you get you get to be whatever you get to create yourself. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to follow the social scripts. But there's so much anxiety about that. Oh, I've got to be something. I've got to do something. And that sphere is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, and so all aspects of life now are, are that. So it's 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 amazing and like so anxiety provoking at the same time. That reminds me of a quote that you said once. So you think you're quoting somebody else. It was uh, anxiety or the dizziness of freedom. Is that the quote or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, Sartre, Sartre. I do think that like a lot of this is, is symptomatic of us just like, We've disconnected from the past and we've disconnected kind of from the future because we don't listen to our elders. So, you know, Gabor Mate talked about this, that that we um, we look up to our peers. You know, like if you look at the YouTube generation, you know, like they're who do they look up to? It's other people like them. It's not people older than them. And we've kind of, I think, culturally almost disregarded all older, wiser voices that have gone through that journey. And so, like, we have no one to look up to and say, hey, here's what it's like over here. You know, so I think that, like, a lot of it, Jasmine, you wrote about this, but just like that separation, that the disentanglement of time, that there is no past to look to and there is no future to look to. And we're just all in the present figuring it out. And, you know, like, I think that that is kind of like losing that has created, you know, this this question of just like, what does it mean to grow up anymore? Because, you know, I mean, to some extent, it is a different world, but in a lot of ways, it's not. Um, we've just not kind of separated ourselves from, from those reference points. And I even resent the question. I feel like the question of growing <laughs> up is like, that's like value laden in and of itself. Like, are we going to stop asking that question at a certain point? Like, what does it mean to grow? Like that, that question comes from a time that like, I feel like we're increasingly like not in anymore, you mm -hmm. know, like, mm -hmm. so when were we going to, are we going to stop asking what it means to grow up? You know, that's a really good point. And it's kind of a false thing too, because, um, even when you do all of the right things, I don't know that you ever stop feeling like you grow up. Like you still feel like a different person now than you were a year ago, you know, no matter what you're doing. And it's a it's a strange marker that maybe never was rooted in anything to, to begin with. I think well, we have other signals that kind of talk to this. And Jean-Louis, you talked about like, what you just talked about in terms of like not talking to our elders anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, I think there's this perception and I I think I'm still also personally trying to figure it out myself in the sense that like I heard this quote like a while ago somewhere about how like the past is fully in the present and just how like everything that happened in the past actually exists in our current day we just like we have this perception of like separating past and present as two different things um but we, if you really notice where present is a lot of the past is weaved into what is happening today and i think you know we talk about like we'll talk later in the signal about like connecting elders with like younger folks but um 
I wonder if there will eventually be this resurgence of like wanting to connect with people who have had these like long, longer lived experiences. And like, we also have a signal somewhere about like, you know, how there are much more older influencers now that are like becoming, you know, like more viral and like attracting younger audiences. And I think there's something really interesting there in terms of like, what can we learn from these folks? Um, And I think that's really just the start of maybe perhaps like this, you know, resurgence of like, yeah, like want to just learn more about people who have lived longer lives than us. Um, And uh, yeah, I think that's, I think that's an interesting, hopeful signal. Uh, So everybody's got a Stanley Cup, I would assume by now. (laughs) Um, Yeah, there, Rebecca. (laughs) Uh, So this is just an article, like ostensibly the article was about why is this Gen Alpha after Gen Z so brand obsessed? They're the most brand like aware, conscious, obsessed of any generation at the time um, that we've ever seen. So that's what it was about. But it's in this section because it's interesting. If you watch this like TikTok, it's all of these girls that look like under 10 um, being so excited to open up, just screaming excited to open up a Stanley. And um, then it talks about the drunk elephant stuff as well. And it's like something that is purely coming from the internet, like from, from TikTok is then now downstream. And like, this, this is my, you know, reality here. And like, you know, Jasmine, you shared that article on our Slack about uh, nobody can understand like the, what this is. And it actually doesn't have to mean anything, but here in reality, people are doing all this, like, you know, frenetic behavior over Stanley's that like is real to them, but it actually started in like, and nobody, it doesn't mean anything, you know? So it's just, again, downstream from, from digital. I think what's really interesting about this is that like with the whole, yeah, because drunk elephant is meant for older people. Like that, you know, has ingredients that are for aging skin and these kids obviously don't have that problem just yet, but (laughs) it points to this idea that like with social media, we, um, these kids are consuming content that is actually built and created for other adults. It's not meant to be targeted to kids. Like we had TV, like to like, you know, after school shows, like certain like slots in which like, oh, this is just kids TV and like kids watch like kids content or whatever. Like, I don't think TikTok necessarily has that. Um, And in terms of just like placing certain ads, that was strategic. You would place like kids products for kids between kids shows or whatever. But, you know, kids are seeing ads that are actually meant for adults, created by adults that were meant for other adults, you know? And so, mm-hmm. um, again, just similarly, again, that like sort of flattening of culture, this yeah. is what happens. It's like you have 10 year olds wanting to buy junk elephant because they're all like sort of living in the same algorithm. Um, so it's fascinating. This makes me think of, um, so when Zuckerberg was doing his kind of podcast tour a little while ago, he was talking about like, I guess the philosophy of the metaverse, the idea that like, what is a room, right? If you put digital artwork up on the walls, so in, if you're in a mixed reality headset, you can see the artwork on the walls, for example, like, is that in the room? Because at some point, the real room becomes the mixed reality environment, not the physical, you know, the digital isn't something separate. And I think that like, it kind of speaks to what we're getting at here, which is just the enmeshment of it all, that at some point reality ha- is by definition include like it is not like, reality is a subset of, you know, like the digital plus, you know, physical. And I think that like, um, it's just very interesting our relationship with these kind of environments and i I do wonder about mixed reality and how that also um will change like where that where the line is between what's digital and what's physical because like it starts to become increasingly blurry and just so much more surface area to the you know our lived experience this one um we've talked about this a lot in our internal like slacks too um yeah i mean i think the article in itself, I feel like, is a signal because it's talking about how a lot of these conversations are still taboo, but we're talking about it now, you know, like more and more like there are these like Reddit subreddits, like talking about like how like AI relationships are coming into therapy sessions and like all these things. And it's only becoming more, it's go- it's only going to become more and more normalized to have these kinds of conversations. And this is talking about how it currently is still like slightly taboo, but, you know, searches for AI girlfriend are up 2,400%. That's a huge amount um and it's and uh and a lot of the people that are featured in this article are just talking about how like it's really helped them you know with their depression or like the anxiety or helping people in social situations and so just the integration of ai again and thinking about how like our these digital things are kind of like entering into our physical reality um and how they affect like our lives is um something to I guess, like keep an eye on and, you know, I don't know about look forward to, I don't know what if I want to say look forward to or not, but um, just something to 
to continue yeah, to the, yeah. you know, keep thinking about. Uh, yeah. And so when ChatGPT and OpenAI launched the uh, the store, it was immediately flooded with uh, AI girlfriend bots and it became a problem. Like this is like the, the top chart in, in everyone. And like it just goes to show in a lot of this, it's like our first exposure to new tech. We're going to go right for the the going to loiter in the bowels of culture. You know, we're not we're not we're not self-actualizing with this yet. You know, like every new thing, it's like, what is the stupidest thing we can do with this? And then we go, we go up from there. And I think like we're seeing that in a lot of domains with generative AI. Well, I, I think the key point here is that like, you know, technology follows a hierarchy of needs. Like the porn industry was ahead on VR, like well over a decade before everyone else. Like it was like the, the Google Cardboard, like that was like, I think one of the primary use cases, essentially, like, yeah, you know, so I, I think that in a lot of ways, that industry tends to be one of the earliest adopters, you know, CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, actually was much smaller than I think there was, a, you know, X, basically, it was an X rated um, uh, movie convention that would happen. And then like downstairs, they sold the VHS tapes and like all the other TV equipment that you'd use to watch it. And eventually, you know, one one transitioned into the other. But the point here is that that industry, I think, um, I guess it's a reflection of human nature, has always been at the very forefront of technology, for, you know, one way or another. I saw, I was, I was dying, I was laughing. There was a clip of somebody talking about, like, Meta has all of the data on VR. They know exactly what the product market fit is, but yet we haven't released anything, you know? Like, <laughs> it's, ex it's exactly that right now, anyway. Mm -hmm. so this is a sad um, girl who took her own life uh, as a result of... Um, fake nude photos of her in the UK. Um, it's just like all it takes is, a, you know, a few photos and people can can do this. And teenagers don't understand yet. And so they share it, even if it's not like uh, online, they share it amongst their peer group. It causes yeah. a lot of damage. Um, it's just something that like we have to get a handle on uh, in, in society. Like what I the part in the orange here, like the next generation like doesn't stand a chance. Like it's already really, really bad. Like the, the data is in on the mental health crisis, especially for young girls now. And then we're about to unleash this. And like, you can't ever stop it for somebody's, somebody doing it in, in their home for their own use. You, you can't like, but you can uh, criminalize the distribution as a sex crime. That's got to be the strong enough deterrent. Like, you yeah. know, we were talking about how X had to, make Taylor Swift's name not searchable for this reason. Um, it's like, you know, you have to just put it on the level of a, a sex crime. I think like it, it's just the litigation here and the laws, like we're so far from figuring it out, but like yeah. it's got to get done. I, I think that, that, yeah, there are, there are two interesting points that your point about the legal framework of like technology is accelerating. Does our legal, do our legal frameworks have the capability to speed up? because they they need to you know like these are these are issues that unfold so quickly but are so severe uh, i think that's a really interesting question of like technology is so yeah i mean the, the, the bottleneck in all of this is our, our legal frameworks and as the stakes get higher and higher like it does raise such an interesting question i think a lot of i mean already in the us like how much cultural tension is a reflection of the courts and the legal system you know like we're already there i think this is just you know we're just turning that up even more um so this is definitely something to to think about in terms of like the procedural updates like is is there a way of doing this better and being faster at responding to these things because like as you say this is um it's pretty shocking all right this next uh piece here is really interesting about um how people are leveraging relatability to create deep fake scams so you know, there was a couple of recent examples that use Taylor Swift, Selena Gomez and Joe Rogan, you know, like Taylor Swift, I guess, is a known proponent of La Crusade, like the rest of us. <laughs> and uh, so people were using that. Like, if you know that about Taylor, that is the Trojan horse that, that you think that this is real. So, yeah, I'm going to give you my personal information to sign up for this contest to win a La Crusade. Uh, and likewise, Joe Rogan with a with a crossbow. So it's like just a new kind of scam. Like, of course, it's going to happen. You know, like there'll be people falling for this. But, but what's interesting about it is that it leverages that personal relatability. That's the mechanism that like opens the wallet and opens the, you know, the personal uh, information. It's Le Crusade, by the way. Le Crusade. Thank it's you. 
this is a perfect artifact of Delulu economics, in my opinion. I think this is, this encapsulates it perfectly. This last or second to last section is about maximizing Second Life, and what we're kind of talking about here is the average um, person, but of any gender, uh, lives to be about seventy six nowadays. And people born today, there's more likelihood they're going to live to be 100 plus. So now we have, you know, 20 to 30 years that we're looking, you know, essentially we're having a second like period or uh, epoch of life that we're, you know, trying to make, you know, filled of like great, you know, quality things. Um, So now these are some interesting developments that could actually help us to live, you know, put more life into those last 20 to 30 years that we didn't have before. Beck's beer is ensuring that happy hour at the pickleball court is going to get a lot happier. Uh, it's a beer specifically designed for the taste buds of 70 plus year olds in mind. It's much more bitter uh, to cater to that audience. Just a great example of like innovation happening for an underserved market. Eldera is a new company that's trying to make intergenerational connections between teenagers who need mentorship for all the reasons we've kind of just been discussing and um, elderly who might have like a lot of extra time and desire to give back. And there's just not a clear social mechanism to make connections like this that like now in society that aren't your family members or people that, you know, like this fills that gap and like, you know, connects the market. And so it'll be really interesting to to watch this. You know, I, I would do it like if I'm older, I could, I could see you, you immediately see the appeal on the on the elderly side. It's just, you know, will teenagers go for it? You know, that's that's probably the biggest question. A couple of um, quick points here about just trying to make the lives of elderly more comfortable through robotics and through a AI. Can household domestic robots keep people in their homes longer? Do you know? doing tasks that, you know, might push them into a nursing home sooner that, hey, we have this layer of help now. And likewise, LQ is a, um, it's a, like a talking uh, chatbot, like, like chat GPT that, you know, provides companionship and can be a personal assistant and in a lot of ways, and just makes the living experience, especially if you're alone, more comfortable. What's cool is to think about you know, second life, people that are this age, like becoming like, you know, brand owners and creators themselves, like what chat GPT has done is enabled everybody to, if I've got a small problem that I can optimize, I can create something to, to solve that. And then, Hey, that's maybe a product that other people want. So the elderly can do the same with their own needs. So it's just, it's interesting to think about that. This one I came across, it's interesting to see how we have as more, we're having more older women who are becoming influencers on TikTok. And I think the most interesting, again, is not necessarily the fact that there are more older women influencers, but who they're attracting actually. So, you know, we, we talk about relatability a lot. We talk about how like people love to see themselves like through, you know, in their algorithms, things like that. In addition to obviously attracting other older women, um, these older influencers are actually attracting younger folks, which is, I think, an interesting signal or, you know, um, to, to think like this, this is actually attracted to younger kids. And like a lot of these influencers have, um, audiences that range between like 18 to 25. Um, and so, you know, when for brands, like it doesn't just, it means that older influencers don't have, not only have the capability of like marketing, like, you know, products for maybe like within their same age, like range or demographic, but even for younger consumers as well. And this maybe also could be potentially like a, a possible way for, you know, like apps like Eldora or like what you were just talking about, Zach, in terms of trying to get like maybe younger folks to be more involved, like the more and more younger people see sort of like older influencers, perhaps like that could spark a curiosity to want to like learn more and be more engaged with like older people, like older influencers. And like, you know, that could be a huge benefit to sort of just the previous conversation we were having in regards to, you know, sort of bridging that gap again. Wild cards. So these are just, uh, you know, signals that didn't fit in a specific theme, but felt significant enough to service and discuss, you know, everything ranging from like public toilet apps to, you know, human behavior. And some things range from like, wow, that's really cool to, you know, oh, wow, there might be something a little bit deeper here. So we'll go through those. The uh, knock-on effects of Ozempic continue and the GLP revolution. Uh, Obesity drugs are impacting travel. Like, duh, when you think about it, like when you feel good in your body, you want to engage with the world. Like you want to do more. And that's what's happening. And not to mention like the economic fuel, like it's staggering that if every American lost 10 pounds, uh, airlines would save $80 million of fuel a year. 
you know, so that's happening. And then they start to speculate here in the right column about, um, hey, it could be good for airlines, all inclusive resorts, cruises, experiences, things like that might be bad for theme parks, hotels, movies. Um, basically, if I make my money on food, um, then that might be bad for me economically. But like why that's interesting is that if you feel good, you just you're just going to do more in the world. And we're just starting to see that. I think that food thing is a little I don't know about that. But um, yeah, if you are in like the Reddit communities for these drugs and you see how much people's lives change and their outlook of the world and how they are ready to engage again. And it's so sad that they didn't feel that they could do that before. And we live in a culture that robs them of that. It's you are brought to tears reading these stories and seeing like how people just feel like they are allowed to just be out there and 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 living and enjoying their lives. So that I I mean I think you 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 have to look far. You see it anywhere there's a community that, that congregates around these medicines. I should have maybe put this in the reality is downstream from digital. Um that if you are an animal with an emoji, uh you guess what? You get more conservation attention than if you don't. So it's just fascinating that the emoji, the humble emoji can like impact, you know, endangered species or or not. Uh, this is a flush app. So if you, you know, you've been in New York City, there's no public bathrooms. We all know this. Major cities, you can't go to the bathroom. Now you can. If you are a cafe owner, you can rent your bathroom on this app. And if I'm a person, I can just like an Airbnb, check in, purchase the like just a way to monetize the bathroom and expand the sense of, uh, you know, public bathrooms. I don't I don't think it'll take off, but it's it's there. Somebody believes it will. I always think of like if I'm with the kids or something and I can't find a bathroom to like change the baby. It's like I know there's a bathroom available somewhere. If I just had like had access to it, I've, I that's crossed my mind. Right. I think this would be a hit in Europe for American travelers because Europe does not believe yeah. in public restrooms for people for some reason. <laughs> but yeah. I think is like our, you know, population ages, like I think it will probably take off maybe. I don't know. I think the issue is again, it's not about like the access, it's also the cleanliness of these public bathrooms typically. Like and you know, like who's gonna fund like getting these old things clean. And it reminds me of this like one I think invention recently it was like a smart toilet and basically it like self cleans or something like that. Like it it, everything is automated inside this little toilet cubicle or whatever it is um but then i feel like i also saw another tiktok about how like this thing malfunctioned and like was flooded like the whole like oh bathroom so you know lots of work there but you know yeah. <laughs> cleanliness i think is i, think I wonder how many about... bathrooms will actually be more than three stars because <laughs> i feel like <laughs> in new york my, i mean it won't be finding a bathroom it'll be finding a five-star bathroom will yeah, be like... Mondo is a super host <laughs> 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 They're like tied to like rental rates in the area too. I'm like, well, this area has cleaner bathrooms. We, that says something. <laughs> oh my yeah, God. you'll start seeing it on Zillow. <laughs> that is like unbelievable. But I, I, I can actually see it as like the most ridiculous thing. <laughs> I'm a super bathroom host. That's my that's my job. That's uh... <laughs> so. This is kind of interesting. So Instacart um, has created a company called Capercart. So it's Capercart by Instacart, and the plan is to sell it to retailers. So they debate debuted it at the National Retail Federation Big Show a few weeks ago. And essentially what it allows retailers to do is to really gamify the shopping experience and reward different purchasing behavior um, or like, you know, streaks. So say like someone's clo- like has purchased ice cream from a certain brand three times. Oh, if you purchase one more time, you get a $5 reward. Um, so they kind of look to inspiration, I think, from like the Starbucks app, which is really gamified uh purchasing you know coffee and obviously food too um but also what it can do is it can so you put something in the cart and it will you know read the price and you can check out right there keep like an eye on your grocery budget um also uh you can like it'll reward going to certain parts of the store so say you go down a certain aisle like you can get a different uh discount or stars or different things that like build up into reward so basically the manager said they're trying to make it like eventually like pokemon go in that regard of like trying different grocery stores different items um so just kind of getting people to you know buy more or buy certain things or you know just really 
you know, bulk up different uh, shopping behaviors. You know, where where they should have tested gamification is in online shopping. I buy all of my groceries online and I always just buy the same stuff because I don't get exposed to new things. There's no gamification. There's no discovery. I feel like that would have been a better place to deploy a technology like this. It's true. I think it also is a symptom of like, like how COVID, we all thought that everything was eventually going to be per- like forever online. Everyone was, everyone was going to, nobody was going to go to grocery stores anymore. But I think this is perhaps also is a cart figuring out that like, oh, actually people still like going to physical stores. So we have to figure out a way to like take over that, you know, segment too. I think the key thing here is well, it's, it's worth remembering, like this is the early, early versions of mixed reality. Like this is, you know, like th- this is us moving to the metaverse in a very like not insignificant way. So when Zuckerberg is talking about, you know, what, when does a room like Im- implicitly imply the digital things in the room as well? Like at what point does a room get considered as a physical and digital space? I think that like these are baby steps, but they're very significant ones uh, of us going there. And it kind of opens up also like a you know, a lot of, if you're advertising, like there's kind of, you know, you're just looking at the screen right there. But like you said, it'd be interesting to like pick your experience if like, you know, the Barbie movie came out and you could pick like a Barbie themed shopping experience. Like it's kind of fun. Interesting. Mm-hmm. This is some information about how women um, are becoming more liberal and they have roughly since 2014 um, and men are becoming less liberal. So you're seeing this gap and this doesn't necessarily bode well in terms of uh, increasing our population because we tend to want to be with and mate with people who are more like with more alike um who are like with us um we share the same values and then speaking of values too um this is a different article um but there's also more of a divide between men and women about um like for specific big issues we consider big issues in america a divide between um men and women saying these issues are um, a very big problem in America. Um, so for example, gun violence, young men in America think it's, a, you know, the 18 to 29 think it's 46%, 46% say it's a big issue versus 65% of women. Um, so again, we're seeing this pretty big gap in you know, what they consider to be important. And then also interesting down here too, I highlighted the loneliness and isolation. Mm. So we know that like loneliness and isolation and friendship is, you know, becoming a big problem specifically for young men, but young men uh, aren't really seeing it as a big problem. This reminds me of that stat that the biggest mating preference among Americans isn't ethnicity, it's whether you're Republican or Democrat. Meaning that over time, being a Republican or Democrat becomes an ethnicity because of how selectively we're, we're breeding ourselves. Now, obviously, party affiliation is going down, so there's a bunch of other things, but it's all pointing to the same stuff, right? Of this, like, divergent culture that, that we're kind of entering into. It is very interesting. Yeah, here's your, here's your data-driven argument for your female communes right here. No, right, I mean, but you're not wrong. Like, yeah. You're actually entirely yeah. not wrong. Right. Like, I get it. Also, we are seeing that more women are identifying as queer, um, so lesbian and bisexual. I think it part of the reason why this is happening is because in general, culturally, I think men have a harder time coming out in general. I think because of just like the shame that comes is associated, yep. especially by men in particular. Mm-hmm. It's like the hardest for them because, you know, just patriarchy, mas- like toxic masculinity, all these things, obviously the list goes on. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it, it does make sense that like, it is a little bit more welcomed to um, for female force with, you know, female identifying people to come out as lesbian or bisexual as opposed to men. Yeah, I still think we're in the phase where it's 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 really hard to tell, like, how much of this is just the cultural environment that, you know, creates the like crazy stats of just, you know, to your point, like, we don't know how much is is latent sort of it's not latent demand, you know what I mean? But it's like latent identity that isn't just publicly um, presented versus, you know, like these kind of, it's, it's too, so it feels like it's too early to disentangle the culture from that, you know? So I think uh, more and more people will start talking about this development, um, but TikTok has released depth to anything, anything, which is a, mon- uh, I don't want to say it, monocular depth estimation. And essentially what this does is it um, is trained off of images and uh, large data sets. And what this does is it changes the game in terms of depth perception and AI. So um, a lot of models before this were very more static, like in terms of analyzing depth. 
But what this model does is it's able to handle things in a more dynamic way. So this is kind of a game changer, specifically for like self-driving cars or underwater exploration, uh, that type of thing. So it was trained off of about 62 million images. Uh, so we're just kind of, it's going to get like, you know, for exploration, for space, for underwater exploration, I think, and self-driving vehicles, I think things are about to get really uh, kind of cool. Also for Gen Z, I know uh, the Super Bowl is coming up, but anime is actually bigger than the NFL for Gen Z. And as we kind of, uh, if you take, you know, from boomers and go down to Gen Z, like as you get younger, uh, anime is becoming bigger and bigger. And um, anime is actually more, like I said, widely viewed uh, than the NFL, again, at least for those younger generations. So they found that um, 40 per 42% of intervie interviewees who identify as Gen Z say they watch anime at least weekly. So um, the Chargers actually also did like an ad or like a hype ad um, that was more, you know, looked like anime. You know, football is something that I think has really rallied a lot of different generations or like there's something that different generations had in common, but um, that might be changing. I, I wonder anime. here, it's a small point, but just... Anime is going to be so much easier to produce with a lot of these AI tools because, I mean, mm -hmm. you can just churn this content out. So I do kind of wonder, like, if we're actually about to see, like, an explosion of, um, or at least animation-style content um, and what that means. Because obviously we have, like, precedent for demand and now we have, like, an infinite, um, like, the, the ability to supply it has just, you know, gone up to X. So I think that, like, it's an interesting point here that, like, um, maybe a lot of the future will be animated. Maybe you'll watch a real-time... NFL match, but it'll be anime. <laughs> you have like an AI animation overlay that will make it more interesting to watch. Who knows? It reminds yeah. me of the, um, uh, the, it was like, I think Nike did it. It was like the, uh, it was like the series of ads for like the women's soccer team. Yeah, and so um, it was a really cool series of like, and like mm -hmm. mixed animation or fully animation, yeah. like clips of like with different soccer players. And they kind of created this whole world. And we're definitely seeing already like the integration of animation and coming into these sort of, especially like obviously in advertising, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, to your point, Jolly, like I wonder if we'll see things like even like live football, like incorporate animation that, that would be very really interesting. It's happening already. There's press that, that exists. Nickelodeon does this with uh, their oh. slime bowl. Like, you know, it's, it's the broadcast. But there's like slime dropping out of the field, and like they're they're do it's aimed <laughs> right, at kids. Yeah. <laughs> but like it's 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 yeah. So that'll happen for sure because there's already precedent. Post reality. That's really nice to know that Nickelodeon is still committed to slime, like when we were children. <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> we're in a slime recession for a little bit, but we got out of it. It's, uh... um, this is the last one, just like a small one, really. Um, just the fact that like. Uh, I use these filters all the time oh when God. Instagram first came out, but they're coming back in resurgence. It's mainly because Addison Ray has been known to like use a lot of these like old Instagram filters. Um, and it's, yeah, it was like super cringy, but they're back. And a part of that is what's interesting is that like Addison Ray was probably way too young to remember any of these filters. So she's, you know, this idea of like trying to use old things to bring about like a new trend or whatever, what had already existed way before. But then also it sort of represents maybe like a time before like the creator economy became like really became a thing, you know, when things were less about algorithm and more just about like posting things for, for fun or whatever. Um, so <laughs> what, what I really want to know, I wish someone could do a study and over time show how far back does something have to be before it qualifies to be nostalgic. And like, cause I feel like that is, shrinking absurdly like you know i have nostalgia for like mid 2023 you know it's just that like how how shrunk does that get it's crazy to me that like i, I get it but you know it's just gonna yeah. keep shrinking because it feels like we're experiencing more life in shorter periods of time because of mm -hmm. all the change i mean you're not wrong it's just like man nostalgia for yesterday like yeah i, I mean nostalgia like, for oh no for go ahead holly what is for holly? 2017 chipotle i don't know if anyone else feels that like, when <laughs> why would happen better, better? It, it was, was better. better. They gave you more food. Like, I just, like, now, I, yeah. All food was better. Chipotle. All yeah, food was better was before. Better. Yeah. But I hear the 2010s are back in style or in trend. So I'm, I don't know how I feel whatever about that. Means. Whatever that means. Whatever that means. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening. These were all the signals for this month's Brand Monthly. And uh, can't wait for the next one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is fun.